Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show with Jason Hartman. The economic storm brewing around the world is set to spill into all aspects of our lives. Are you prepared? Where are you going to turn for the critical life skills necessary to survive and prosper? The Holistic Survival Show is your family's insurance for a better life. Jason will teach you to think independently, to understand threats, and how to create the ultimate action plan. Sudden change or worst case scenario, you'll be ready. Welcome to Holistic Survival, your key resource for protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we talk about protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in these uncertain times. We have a great interview for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds on the Holistic Survival Show. And by the way, be sure to visit our website at holisticsurvival.com. You can subscribe to our blog, which is totally free, has loads of great information, and there's just a lot of good content for you on the site. So make sure you take advantage of that at holisticsurvival.com. We'll be right back. It's my pleasure to welcome James Howard Kunstler to the show. I have been a fan of his work for several years now, and he publishes a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, He has a weekly blog, podcast, many books, and I originally found him when he uh, had his book out entitled The Long Emergency, Surviving the End of Oil, Climate Change, and Other Converging Catastrophes of the 21st Century. It's a pleasure to have him with us on the show today. James, welcome. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. It's a beautiful day in upstate New York. Well, fantastic. Give us a little bit of your background. You are making some some pretty big and dire predictions, if I may say, and just wanted to kind of dive into your work and, and what your latest thoughts are. Uh, gee, I didn't, you know, I, it's funny because I don't consider them dire. I, I'm a <laughs> <Really>? journalist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm a journalist. I'm an author. I, you know, I don't pretend to be an academic. I uh, published a number of books on the fiasco of suburbia. Back in, my, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I started that series and about urban design because I was interested in, you know, why the human habitat in America was just so unrewarding and so so lacking in, in uh, grace and, and amenity. And so I wrote The Geography of Nowhere and then I published Home from Nowhere, a sequel, which was kind of about the new urbanist movement and some of the remedies for bad bad town planning and bad architecture. And then I wrote a book about the, about called The City in Mind, about cities. And then in 2005, I published The Long Emergency. And that was about this, uh, you know, what was developing to be a, a set of predicaments that the human race faced, and America in particular, because of our lifestyle and the way we do things. And um, so, you know, what I, I predicted was we were going to get into trouble with oil and we were going to get into trouble with finance. And indeed, we have gotten into trouble with both of them. And, and also that we would get into trouble with something else that, that has now become an especial problem in America, which is delusional thinking. And uh, I think the reason for that is that as a society becomes distressed, the wishful thinking and belief in magic and 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 the supernatural kind of increases. And in fact, I wrote a, another book published in 2012 called Too Much Magic, Wish, uh, Technology, Wishful Thinking, and the Fate of the Nation. And it was largely about how we were trying to tell ourselves that shale oil and shale gas would allow us to keep driving to Walmart forever. And I just don't think it's going to work out that way. So I hope that's not too much information. Yeah, well, no, that's ask. that's great, because one of the areas where I was going to pick a debate with you, if you will, is on shale oil and how the U.S. seemingly, to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but is slated to be the next big energy exporter if our government will let it happen. It's complete nonsense. No? Okay, tell tell me more. Yeah. Well, we're, we're not going to, that's not going to happen. The The shale oil enterprise is going to be proved to be very ephemeral. And the way I would encourage your listeners to think about it is in the following way. 
we had uh, many, many decades of cheap oil, and that's pretty much what made the, the current version of the American economy, or at least the most recent version of the American economy, what it was. Absolutely. Now, before you go on, I just want you to maybe define cheap oil a little bit. I mean, how much per barrel in, and you can cite real or nominal dollars, but just tell us which one we're talking about. Uh, you know, well, are you t- I, when, when say you say that, cheap, uh, what does that mean? To me, that that in today's dollars, it probably means oil under $35 a barrel. And, and we stopped seeing that in uh, really the early 2000s. We're nowhere near that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we we briefly touched it, you know, during the crash of 2008 when the price of commodities crashed, but that was only a very brief uh, thing. And, you know, oil has basically been in the uh, $75 to $110 range since then. Right, right. Okay, go on. Well, the, so the way to think about it is this. You know, we had this uh, era of cheap oil. And you compare a, a Texas oil classic Texas oil well of the mid 20th century to a shale oil well. Classic Texas oil well, East Texas, 1930s, it cost about $400,000 in today's money to drill. It produced thousands of barrels a day for decades. Uh, Tremendously high flow, tremendously cheap to produce, easy to work with, room temperature, you could drive to work, didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, being up in the Arctic Ocean or anything. Very easy to, to go there. Okay, North Dakota. The average well in North Dakota cost between 6 and $12 million in today's dollars. The average flow of uh, the Bakken uh, North Dakota shale oil is about 80 barrels a day. That's compared to thousands of barrels a day in Texas. Okay, 80 barrels a day. It loses, it, it depletes by over 50% the first year and over 20% the second year. So unlike the Texas oil that produces for decades at high rates, the Bakken shale oil craps out after a few years. And that's what you're going to see. And you're also going to see something else. You're going to see that the capital is not there to do the production because one of the problems with expensive oil is that it, it impairs uh, capital formation in the kind of financial system that has that we have evolved into. And the capital is not going to be there to perform these expensive operations to get the shale oil out of the ground. So not only is it going to deplete very quickly, but we're going to find that we don't have the money even to pursue it after a certain point. So um, I think that what you're going to see is that this is a delusion that the, the, the media has been suckered into this story by the oil industry, which is desperate to get as much investment as possible to keep up doing what they're doing because they got nowhere else to go. Um, most of the other places where they did business, where they did uh, oil uh, exploration and production in foreign countries, the, the, that oil has been nationalized. And they're, so they can't go there anymore. The only thing that's left for them is, is the dregs of what's in North America. So that's what you're seeing. What, you know, what's going to happen with shale oil is the, the uh, American people are going to be hugely disappointed and they're, they're going to feel that they were lied to. Uh, this will be just another thing that they will have been lied to about and it will be just another thing that will erode the legitimacy and the authority of the people who run things in this country. And that's a very dangerous thing to do politically. Well, hey, uh, I don't think there's much legitimacy and authority of the, of the people who run things anymore, whether it be at the, at the highest levels of government or the financial system. They're still running, they're still running their stuff. Fair enough. They, there hasn't so, been a revolution yet. And yeah. There's no revolution going on. So, you bread, know, bread and all, that, all that shows is that all that shows is that we haven't reached the tipping point of the, of people really being disgusted with it. Yeah, fair fair enough and it they they should be more disgusted, no question about it. But we've uh we've got this complacent society, we've got the bread and circuses, we've got enough comfort and food stamps to keep people fat and stupid and it's just it's ridiculous. But that's almost another discussion which I know you'll have something to say about. So, it's fair to say then that you're you're a peak oil guy, right? Yeah, and and peak oil is not a yesterday's story, contrary to a lot of the other propaganda out there. It's still it's still with us, very much with us. Okay, and what about natural gas? Yeah, well, natural gas is a very similar story. There's there's a kind of a myth going around that we have a hundred years of uh, shale gas 
a hundred years of, of natural gas. And, you know, it's just not going to happen. We, we produced a lot of it in a short amount of time. We drilled a lot of wells since uh, 2007, 2008, and we drove the price down. And, uh, and by the way, a lot of, of, that, of those drilling rigs have now gone to the shale oil plays. So they're not there anymore. The price of shale gas will probably be going up. That will help the producers because at the current price, they can't uh, actually make a profit drilling for shale gas at three and a half dollars a unit. So uh, that's just another thing that's going to end up disappointing the American people that, you know, we don't have enough shale gas to keep on running Walmart forever. Right, right. And what about alternative energy? I mean, uh, do you have any hope that there's uh, something that works out there or, or, or that anything we have now works or something will... There are know, a lot of things that of... work, but they don't, they don't work in the way that people expect. And this is, this is another rather tragic problem is that uh, we're going to be disappointed by what renewables and alternative energy can do for us. You know, they can, they can do things, but we're not going to run the interstate highway system, Walt Disney World, Suburbia, Walmart, the U.S. Army... Uh, and all of our other stuff on any combination of solar, wind, algae secretions, ethanol, biomass, dark matter, you know, it's just not going to happen. And it's going to be another one of those things that will disappoint people about technology. And, you know, all of these things that I'm saying are not, uh, they don't amount to an invitation to be depressed and, and become suicidal. The message here is that we got to change our behavior. We have to live differently in this country. The, this question that you asked me about, you know, what about alternative energy? Well, the subtext to that, which your listeners did not hear because you did not state it is, is, is and I don't even know if you, if you thought this, but, but it's really in there. The subtext is, how can we keep on running all the stuff we're running now by other means? And the answer is we're not. We and we shouldn't. And in your, in your mind, we shouldn't. We should. We should run we on less, right? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. because in my mind, you know, I, I'm interested in reality. I, I like to live in a reality-based world rather than a wishful thinking-based world. And reality has plans for us. And and what reality wants us to do is find some new ways to live and and to change the way we operate many of the basic systems for daily life, including. Agriculture, we got, got to do that differently. The way we do commerce and trade, we got to do that differently. The way we make our, our household goods, got to do that differently. The way we do transportation, we're definitely going to have to do that differently. Uh-huh. Well, tell, so, well, tell you know, us all these you, things. That, that's a great statement. So drill down on those, if you would, those bullet points you just mentioned. How should we do them differently? Well, let's start with transportation because, you know, the automobile is behind a lot of our desperation. Right. You know, having built a society that is tragically dependent on automobiles for everything we do every day, uh, you know, we can't imagine uh, what, what might happen if we, if we can't do that. And the, I think the truth is we won't be able to run our cars the way we have been, probably in a very short time. Uh, the same thing is true, by the way, of the airlines. I think the airlines are going to go out of business. They're already kind of in the process of dwindling. They, they've been doing it by increments and, and by, you know, merging and by dropping roots and by firing everybody they could fire and eliminating the pensions of their former employees, et cetera, et cetera. They've done everything they can now. And the only thing that's left for them to do is to uh, fly fewer routes and fly fewer passengers, and that's what's happening now. So basically, we're going to lose the passenger airline system, and we're going we're gonna to see the happy motoring system dwindle. What do we do? Well, one of the things we ought to do that we should have started doing three decades ago was rebuilding the railroad system in America. We're going to need it desperately. Nobody's interested in doing it, uh, and that includes most members of the public and most leaders, including leaders in business and politics. Nobody sees any benefit in it, but uh, I'm telling you, you know, if we don't do that, we're going to be in terrible trouble. We're not going to be able to go anywhere in this very large country. So that's, that's one project that's terribly important. And the reason I mention it first is that it's something that we could do if we just had the political will to do it. And, and if we did do it, we would accomplish something very important. And on top of inco- accomplishing something important, we would, we would set an example for ourselves 
to demonstrate to ourselves that we were capable of doing the other things that we have to attend to. You know, we're going to have to reform agriculture because we can't just keep on turning oil into food. You know, we, we're going to have to make agriculture smaller, finer, more local. We're going to have to grow our food closer to home on smaller farms, probably using more human labor, probably using more animal labor. You know, we're making no plans for these things. In the meantime, you know, we're, we're destroying the soil and we're, uh, we're running out of capital because the other big input for industrial agriculture after oil-based fertilizer or oil and gas-based fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides, uh, uh, the, the biggest input is capital. You have to borrow a lot of money to get the crop in every year. And we're, we're moving into a capital scarce uh, economy. So, and, and I think that uh, the way these things are going to work out will surprise people. For example, the whole motoring thing does not just hinge on the price of gasoline. A lot of people, you know, that's the only metric they can understand this with, you know, is, is, is the price of gasoline up at the pump or is it down at the pump? Well, guess what? When you enter a, a period of capital scarcity, what that means also is that there are going to be far fewer car loans available and far fewer people who qualify for them. Right. So the cost of ownership goes up a lot. Well, it's not, it's not that it co goes up. It's that the fewer people can afford it, whatever the price is. Right, right. Yeah, but, but, but most people buy a car on a payment, not the price of the car. So even if the price of the car drops, but the cost of financing or the unavailability of financing, if financing is scarce, the, the, the little that's out there will be more expensive. Well, the point is that they have to buy the cars on installment loans, period. And, and, and if the money for loans is scarcer, and if, if fewer people qualify, there will be fewer people participating in the motoring system. And, and, you know, you can say the same thing about maintaining the infrastructure for motoring, because uh, we're seeing already that states and municipalities and counties are going broke. Uh, the capital is not there. And, and we're going to enter a period of triage where we have to make very difficult decisions about what stuff we fix and what stuff we don't fix. Okay, so I, I, I've, go I've got so many questions for you. This is so fascinating. So first of all, I mean, you've been very critical of suburbia, and I, I know the reasons why the, you know, the car and the dependency in the car, it just, the whole equation doesn't work. It's also, a you know, it's generally a miserable place to live. Yeah. Now, why is it miserable? Because there's not enough to do? Because all the houses are cookie cutter? Why do you say that? I'm That's just part of it, yeah. because it's, 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 monotonous to an unbelievable extreme and but it also it has no connection at all with the things that make life rewarding it has no connection to amenity other than having a lot of bathrooms in pro pro proximity to where you live <laughs> okay so what kind of amenity like culture performing arts yeah, what, are you, culture, what are you talking about yeah, okay culture commerce uh social interaction I was in Irvine, California. Yeah. Oh God. I, yeah. I, and, that's the, that's the prime example. You know, I spent oh my most of my adult life in Irvine and I, I used to love it and now I hate it. <laughs> well, yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I, I was just amazed at how dead every place was that I went to, you know, except for the strip mall. James, I'm going to tell you something funny about that. You know, I sold real estate there for many, many years. Okay. And in Irvine, it, it frequently wins the FBI crime ranking for one of the safest cities in America over 100,000 people. Yeah, is that the people. only thing yeah. that we no, care no, about? Listen, hang, hang on. You, you're going to like what I have to say. So, you know, it frequently wins this. And a couple of years ago when it won it again, I posted on my Facebook, I said, here we go again. Irvine wins the safest city in America. So at least we know if we live there, we'll probably never die. The only problem is we may never live because it's so boring. <laughs> so, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. You know, I agree. Well, that's just the stupid metric. You know, it's just such a one-dimensional, stupid way of understanding the human habitat. I know. But if you talk to the typical, like, family person there, and I'm single, so I, I hated it. But, you know, you talk to the typical, like, family person there with 2.2 kids and a dog and a, and a couple, you know, they seem to like it pretty well. I don't know. Well, that may be what they would tell you superficially, but I think if you dug a little bit deeper, you'd find that, you know, they're spending half their day in the car, that they rarely see people, be, anybody besides that their own family. They go in and out of the garage, I know, yeah. You know, and, and that, in fact, uh, there's a tremendous amount of ennui, boredom, 
anime purposelessness and and uh you know just plain depression well it's like the show uh, desperate housewives you know that's, <laughs> that's sort of a metaphor for it so who do you think is doing it right or is anybody doing it right like is europe doing it right with the cafe culture and the high density inner city core well, we're talking strictly about about uh, the human habitat now right, right. yeah well, there's no question that, you know, anybody who has gone to Europe, anybody who's spent any time in France or Italy or Spain or Denmark, you know, or other places, there's no question that their towns and cities are just better than anything in America by orders of magnitude. Just the, the richness and rewarding quality of these places. Um, you know, they have problems with their economy. Oh, with their economies, they, they, have, yeah. they have problems that are every bit as complex as ours. But at least they didn't screw up their towns and their cities. Yeah. Well, they built them a long time ago when they didn't well, have true. the car and the cheap oil. And, that's you know, true. So, so America was afflicted with a different point in time. That's true. And, and uh, you know, I think that uh, what that points to is, you know, a certain theory of history that I subscribe to which is that societies do things because they seem like a good idea at the time. And, you know, American society did what it did in the mid-20th century. We made the choices that we made because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Now, the catch is that life is tragic, and sometimes groups and societies make bad choices, and then you're stuck with the consequences. So, you know, what seemed like a good idea at the time is now a banquet of con consequences that we have to feast at rather unhappily. And so who, uh, like, I get I get the picture of suburbia and kind of like who's to blame for that. It's just sort of history and the way we made choices at the time. But when you, when you look at all of this overall and, and all of these challenges that we face, and we haven't even jumped into the monetary policy side of things, which I really would like to cover that with you as well, but because you have some interesting thoughts on it. But who, who's to blame? Uh, I mean, is it is it this sort of fake prosperity? Is it getting off the gold standard back in 71 and expanding the money supply? And, and you know, I, I look at it as like this just smoke and mirrors economy in which we live. It's a joke. It's just a it's really a Ponzi scheme. Well, we're trying to offset our inability to create more wealth or to form capital with really a, a banking system and a financial system now that's based on accounting fraud and, uh, and, and interventions and manipulations. And the people behind it at the Federal Reserve and, and probably even the Wall Street banks are not necessarily evil guys twirling their mustaches. You know, they're human beings with families and feelings like everybody else. But you know, they're doing something which is uh, a tragic thing. You know, they're, they're trying to replace an economy that is in the process of contracting with um, tricks and it's not going to it's going to end up producing a lot of hardship and a lot of uh, misery two books i want to ask you about i'm not sure if you're familiar with them but i i get really negative on on the future a lot for many good reasons i think but then i kind of turn a little bit after i read a book like abundance by peter diamantis i don't know if you're familiar with that one i had stephen kotler as co-author on the show yeah. and gosh you know it's like there are so many is technology the the basic premise is is techno will technology save us from ourselves you know maybe it will uh that's not my opinion you know i think i think that we're investing too much hope and too much wishing that that uh, some mythical they in quotes will quote come up with a set of rescue remedies that will allow us to keep driving to Walmart forever. Mm -hmm. You know that's sort of the master wish in America these days to keep on driving to Walmart forever. And uh, the American you know, mentality: more is more <laughs> instead of less well, is more. You know, yeah. That's the master wish. I, I think that the fact of the matter is that the money's not going to be there and we're in a comprehensively contracting economy and we have to the biggest task that we face that is kind of a comprehensive task is managing contraction it's very very difficult because you know uh, so many of the mechanisms of our economy and culture that we have depended on just don't work in uh, a in the uh context of contraction like credit issuance and and the repayment of debt does not work uh in a, in a con contracting 
economy. And so we have to find some other way to do our stuff. You know, um, in the old days, you know, uh, let's say in the 19th century, a lot more business was done on the basis of money that had already been saved, not just on loans. You know, people started started corporations with capital that had been saved up by people, you know, whether it was actual, that, actual real, honest to God, capital formation. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and we probably have to get back to something like that. If we're even going to continue operating civilization at a lower level, but I don't, I don't know how we're going to get to that point. My guess is, and this is probably one of the reasons that people think that I'm, uh, you know, a doomer gloomer, although I don't see myself that way. But it seems very, very likely that we will go through some kind of a bottleneck that will be uh, that will will represent a, a considerable considerable amount of hardship for people. And uh, you know, nobody likes to think about it, but um, we're probably we're probably heading into it, and uh, we're not doing anything to avoid it. You know, we're not making any plans. We're not reforming any of the systems that we need to reform. You know, we need to reform agriculture and do it differently. There's no conscious effort. There's no leadership to do that. We need to rebuild and change the transportation yep. system. Be We're not be doing before that. Before you go on on the agriculture issue, I mean, you know, you've got so all these entrenched interests, like these huge That's food just companies. Excuse. You're just well, making well, an excuse. No, no, no. I mean, listen, I don't, I, do I don't, I don't like it. I'm just saying it's, it, it's. I don't the, like the, it either. The but corporatocracy that's the is the reality. The corporatocracy and their affiliation with government. I mean, we're in this sort of socio-fascist environment. Well, then, you know, the consequence of that is that we won't do what we got to do, and then we will live in a disorderly contracting economy and, and a disorderly society. People might say I'm a doomer, but one thing I don't believe is making ex – I don't believe in making excuses for why you're not doing stuff, and I don't believe in being a crybaby. And I don't even particularly uh, uh, believe in casting a whole lot of blame on people. You know, it, there's really an awful – there's an awful lot that we can do – and we're wasting our time wringing our hands. Yeah, right, right. So is the future uh, on the monetary and economic side, is the future inflationary or deflationary? Well, my just sort of gut take on it all is that we are heading into uh, a, a very serious deflation that could easily mutate into a hyperinflation if we do the kinds of things that we have been doing, namely creating more money out of no out of thin air to try to make up for the fact that we've got uh, a uh, crippled economy so so all the trends right now seem to indicate that we're heading into a very serious deflationary contraction because for the simple reason that we have too much debt that can never be repaid and those debts will be repudiated and and when they are uh, you know, money vanishes and wealth vanishes and capital vanishes. Okay, so, so when you talk about debt, are you talking about the debts of the nation? Are you talking All about the it. debts of the individual? Uh, all of it. Yeah, but it, but it works out so differently. I mean, well, it's all look. It's all borrowed money, and right. it's all money that they are. It all amounts to a set of promises that uh, cannot you know, be one, met. One yeah. person or or one group or entity has made to another group or person or entity, and uh, you know uh, obligations that can't be met are obligations that can't be met, and uh, it doesn't really matter that much whether they're public or private. Ultimately, they will all be expressed in the disappearance of wealth and money, or the disappearance of the value of money. So, couple couple things there, uh, or yeah, and and really, we should call it currency, probably, and just to be more accurate, it's it's not money. <laughs> but James, do you think the U S. would could lose its reserve currency status? Uh, sure, of course. Uh, yeah, I think we could destroy the dollar, but uh, I, I'm not sure that any of the other currencies in the world would take its place. Well, I, that's you what know, it, in yeah. in the novels that I wrote in World Made by Hand and The Witch of Hebron. The situation had gotten to the point not in the not very distant future that uh, the American the American people were using circulating silver coins because uh, there were no paper currencies that that people that had any credibility anymore. So, you know, I think that that's 
a possible, you know, mid to longer term outcome. Yeah. You must be fascinated by this whole Bitcoin situation. I I bet you've been following that. Yeah, I have been, but I I think that it's really just another kind of... It's a fad. I I think uh, think they'll put it out of business. I think it's kind of a technological uh, scam that seems to have a lot of appeal right now because, you know, there are things you can do with computers that appear to protect people. But, you know, it, it, it's not real. It's, it, you know, it's, it, it's just ephemeral wealth that has no real anchor to anything. So uh, I, I'm not persuaded that Bitcoin is going to. I'm also. Oh, me you know, neither. I, I, I've always said, I think that anything that is a, a competitive force to the Federal Reserve, to the fiat money system will be destroyed. They will figure out a way, whether it be FBI no, raid, to, regulatory. I think they'll try to destroy it, but yeah. they won't succeed. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Well, what are they going to do? Go gather up all the silver coins that, uh, in America? Yeah, you well, know, all the all the pre nineteen sixty five silver coins. I don't think they're going to. That can't happen. That's you know? Yeah. Happen. I mean, it's awfully hard to do that with uh, with the metals. But we did it a little bit in nineteen thirty three, right? So, but but you know, with Bitcoin, they can just say it's illegal. You know, like they said, pyramid schemes were illegal or something. I suppose they can just outlaw it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. It's it's interesting. Well, any thoughts on just to kind of wrap up here on on what we should do as individuals? Well, I think that uh, young people especially have to be very careful about the place that they decide to move to and uh, start to try to make a life in. There are, there are parts of the United States that are just uh, not going to make it. Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, do, do you want to call I mean, some of those I, out, I just, like any I recommendations? Just would, I just wouldn't move to Phoenix, Arizona. I, you know, I'd stay out of South, Southern California. So Southern California is going to be the worst of all. Why is Phoenix so bad? <laughs> well, the, you know, they... Uh, the climate is terrible and will get worse. And uh, it's because oh, so you're saying because of global warming? It's 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 liable to get worse, okay. but it's already bad enough so yeah. that you know if this became a poorer society, I mean the, the only the only reason that Phoenix works is because absolutely everybody can have air conditioning, right? Right. Yeah. Including the guy who you know uh, cleans your pool. Yeah. Yeah. But so, remember, that's only an issue about four months of the year. The other well, eight, it's pretty nice. It's going to be a, a problem. What will be a bigger problem probably is that, you know, you, you can't really grow a lot of food there without heroic uh, yeah, right, right. irrigation. So, and it's also the way it's been designed, it, it's so drastically automobile oriented that there's, the capital is not going to be there to retrofit it for, you know, uh, walkability or, or anything that we really need to do. So uh, it's just going to prove to be a throwaway city. Okay. So give, a, give us a couple others. So I say Southern California, when the, when the government aid stops, you know, I grew up in LA and uh-huh. I hate LA, <laughs> but I did grow up there. And, and, and you know, that's just going to be a disaster. I mean, the civil unrest is going to be immense in Southern California. California. That's going to be a very dangerous place, if you ask me. Well, I think it might be. Um, I'm generally a little bit. I, I, I'm. I don't think that the the entire Sun Belt is going to be a very favorable place. I think it's going to end up being a you know an agricultural backwater. The so, way it so once what, was. what what is favorable? Oregon. Well, I think that Oregon has some uh, appeal, and I think the Pacific Northwest in general has, you know, there's there's reasons why people might want to be there. I think the Great Lakes region uh, is highly undervalued because it's excellent agricultural land, great farmland. Uh, I think that our economy in the years ahead, as as we deglobalize and decomplexify, I think our economy is going to become much more internally focused in North America and that the Great Lakes and all the inland waterways are going to be much more important than they have been for the last 60, 70 years. You know, Jim, I forgot to mention that other book. I mentioned Abundance, which is pretty interesting, but also Chris Martinson's new book called Makers, which is a lot about 3D Mm -hmm. printing, another technology could rescue us type of thing. But I don't know. He makes a pretty good case. Uh... I don't know enough about 3D printing, so I'm really not equipped to talk about it. Fair enough. So, so de- we will the globalization will actually subside rather than increase. Well, it's huh? not it's not a permanent fixture of the human condition, con- contrary to what Tom Friedman would like everybody to believe. Yeah, yeah the world isn't that flat. I I, I don't think the it's world's that not flat, that yeah. flat. And in right. fact, you know, we're now going in the other direction. That a lot of 
look at the globalism happened because of a set of special circumstances in, in a particular time and place in history. And, and uh, you know, you, you can actually state what those conditions were about a century of relatively cheap energy and about a half a century of relative peace between great powers. And that allowed these long manufacturing supply chains and resource supply chains to evolve. And now we're in a different situation. We, we no longer have cheap energy and we're beginning to get friction between the great powers uh, in, in what Michael Clare has characterized as you know, a race for what's left, resource wars, or at least uh, uh, you know, a sort of a fight over the table scraps of the, the global resources. So um, you know, this is going to create a certain amount of friction and conflict and already is between, especially between us and China. So, you know, I think that that's only going to um, develop further and that uh, globalism it will be unraveling and unwinding. Yeah, you know, there's this pervasive thought. I think it's, it's like the, it's just the whole backdrop, the whole context in which we all live that in order to have a good economy, you must grow. You must grow. And your October 16th entry on your, on your blog is growth is obsolete, which is an an interesting idea that growth does not equal prosperity. Can you just comment on that real quickly? Well, that was a, actually an essay I wrote for Chris Martinson's website, and and the full essay is there. But the point is simply this: is that it's growth is a word that's getting us into a lot of trouble because of the the because our uh, uh, energy is no longer cheap. We're having uh, a big problem now with capital formation, and we're not going to get the kind of growth that is expressed in the beloved metrics of the economists, in, in the statistics that they're comfortable with, with GDP and et cetera. And so my proposal is that we really have to replace the word growth with the term economic activity, because we certainly want to have activity. We certainly want people to be occupied and to be uh, to be eating good food and and le living in clean, well lighted places, and to be comfortable and have culture and and have civilization. But but we may have to express that wish differently, and and certainly not in just the stupid metrics of uh, you know statistical analysis. And you know, there's one other final thing about that is that uh, we have this. You know, as part of the the huge cargo of of stupid beliefs that we have subscribed to lately in America, you know, the, this thing behind uh, econometrics and statistical analysis, which is so pervasive now, you know, we're we're always turning to studies for the statistics to try to prove some point. Well, the reason behind that is this neurosis that we think that if we can just measure everything, then we can then we can control everything. And it is a neurosis, and we're going to discover that we can't control everything. That, you know, to some extent, reality has mandates of its own, and reality has, a, uh, has plans for us. I, I, love, I love that saying, by the way, reality has plans for us, yeah. We have to, we have to get on board with, with what reality wants us to do, and then try to arrange our lives around the, the demands and requirements of reality. One one last time before you go, I'll I'll just play devil's advocate with you. I mean, back in the 1700s, you had these, you know, you had uh, Thomas Robert Malthus. You had these Malthusian ideals that we were the scarcity. We had a population problem, and certainly the population is much higher now. I mean, hasn't hasn't technology rescued us to some extent? I mean, what what is why do we know this now? That's and, such and a it was, dumb it was idea. That's such a Tell dumb me. idea. Yeah. Okay. You know, obviously, you know, we, we blundered into a we blundered into a reserve of fossil oil of this liquid fuel that allowed us to postpone that particular reckoning but, for two hundred years. That didn't happen but, for but all we years did, later. But I mean, all really well, we had coal first. Okay. okay so all we, right. you know, Malthus published his famous essay in seventeen ninety eight. So it was virtually the takeoff point of the Industrial Revolution. And so the Industrial Revolution happened. We took advantage of those fossil fuels. You know, we made food out of them, basically. And we supported a, an enormous population, which is now doing so much damage to the ecosphere, 
to the planet itself that you know there's just no way that we're going to accommodate you know an, another billion or two billion or three billion people so you know we have to get with the reality that we we really have reached uh, the limit for increasing human population and we're not going to solve it with technology we're not going to fly off the planet within any uh, imaginable period of time and inhabit other planets like this so you know we have to get real with uh, with uh, living here in a practical way and we're not interested in doing that so you know the upshot will be that we'll go through a, a rather painful collapse the population will go way down uh, and uh, you know then we'll have to reckon with the the damage that we've done to the to the, to our soils to uh, our, our aquifers, to, uh, you know, many of the things that we depend on this planet. And, uh, you know, we're, we're probably going to go through a very long period, if the human race does survive, of, uh, you know, relative austerity. Well, good, good to hear all of this stuff. It's uh, certainly a, a warning call. James Howard Kunstler, thanks for joining us. Give out your website, if you would, and tell people where they can find out more about you. My website is www dot kunstler k-u-n-s-t-l-e-r dot com my books are on there my weekly blog is on there my essays are on there and and you can find out about me fantastic jim thanks for joining us and uh uh, appreciate it okie dokie you know penny sometimes i think of jason hartman as a walking encyclopedia on the subject of creating wealth Well, you're probably not far off from the truth, Britch. Jason actually has a six-book set on creating wealth that comes with over 100 hours of the most comprehensive ideas on investing in business. They're in high-quality digital download audio format, ready for your car, iPod, or wherever you want to learn. Yes, and by the way, he's recently added another book to the series that shows you investing the way it should be. This is a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Jason actually shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets that are untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches us how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. He's recorded interviews with Harry Dent, Peter Schiff, Robert Kiyosaki, Pat Buchanan, Catherine Austin Fitz, Dr. Dennis Waitley, T. Harv Eker, and so many others who are experts on the economy, on real estate, and on creating wealth. And the entire set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered with a savings of $385. Now to get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series complete with over 100 hours of audio and six books, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. Thank you for joining us today for the Holistic Survival Show, protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Be sure to listen to our Creating Wealth Show, which focuses on exploiting the financial and wealth creation opportunities in today's economy. Learn more at www.jasonhartman.com or search Jason Hartman on iTunes. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, offering very general guidelines and information. Opinions of guests are their own, and none of the content should be considered individual advice. If you require personalized advice, please consult an appropriate professional. Information deemed reliable, but not guaranteed.